thus have I heard. At one time the Blessed One was dwelling near Uruveda, on the bank of Naranjara River, at the root of the Bodhi tree, having just realized awakening. At that time the Blessed One sat at the root of the Bodhi tree for seven days in one session, experiencing the bliss of liberation. Then, after the end of the seven days, after emerging from that samadhi, in the first watch of the night, he gave close attention to dependent origination, and in forward order, thus. When this is, that is. From the arising of this comes the arising of that. Namely, with ignorance as conditions, fabrications come to be. With fabrication as condition, consciousness. With consciousness as condition, name and form. With name and form as condition, the six sense spaces. With the six sense spaces as condition, contact. With feeling as condition, with contact as condition, feeling. With feeling as condition, craving. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, becoming. Is becoming as condition birth. Is birth as condition aging, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair come to be. This is the causal origination of this whole mass of suffering. Then, on realizing the significance of that, the Blessed One spoke on that occasion this inspired utterance. When things have become clear to the ardent meditating Brahmin, all doubts vanish because he has seen things together with the causes. Then in the second watch of the night, the Blessed One gave close attention to dependent origination in verse order thus. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. Namely, with the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of fabrications. With the cessation of fabrications comes the cessation of consciousness. With the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of name and form. With the cessation of name and form comes the cessation of the six sense spaces. With the cessation of the six sense spaces comes the cessation of contact. With the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. With the cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of becoming. With the cessation of becoming comes the cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair cease. This is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Then, on realizing the significance of that, the Blessed One spoke on that occasion this inspired utterance. When things have become clear to the ardent meditating Brahmin, all doubts vanish because he has experienced the cessation of conditions. In the third watch of the night, he gave close attention to dependent origination in forward and reverse order. Thus, when this is, that is, from the arising of this comes the arising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. Namely, with ignorance as condition, fabrications come to be. And so on as before. This is the causal origination of this whole mass of suffering. With the cessation of ignorance comes come the cessation of fabrications. And so as before. This is the cessation of the whole mass of suffering. Then, on realizing the significance of that, the Blessed One spoke on that occasion this inspired utterance. When things have become clear to the ardent meditated in Brahmin, he stands, having destroyed Mara's armies, like the sun illuminating the sky. So, these were the first three inspired verses spoken by the Buddha, one week after he had realized awakening.
also one week um, after this awakening the Buddha is fathoming dependent origination in all details for one night the Buddha didn't call his teaching Buddhism that word was invented by Europeans in the 19th century um, he himself called his teaching the Dhamma and so the Dhamma is the law of causality and that the Buddha discovered um, which operates in the conditioned realm um, this law how Sankara's conditioned phenomena originate and can come to cessation and by fully understanding that he also found something beyond conditions beyond causality um, Nibbana and so what the Buddha teaches is this law of nature to which he awakened and he says this specific conditionality will always be the same in the universe whether it's 30 eons in the past or 90 eons in the future and whether a Buddha teaches it and proclaims it or not this law of causality is always the same how Sankharas operate and so dependent origination so it describes the causal origination of the five khandas or the six sense bases or the origin of dukkha, of suffering and how this process of origination comes to be and then how this process can be brought to an end if on a small scale in the mind, in the heart and on the cosmic scale of all conditioned phenomena um, one experiences and, uh, the Buddha says this six sense spaces so the visual faculty and the things that you see the hearing faculty, the ear, things that you hear and so on and the mind um, and also the five khandas they are the all so the all is everything that you experience so the so the explanation of the Buddha is how the universe or our experience originates and how the small mass of suffering or samsara can be brought to an end and as the Buddha says at the beginning um, there are two causal principles so when this is that is and from the arising of this comes the arising of that so one say one of immediate causality so similar like for example if you switch on a light switch then the light will turn on and the other one from the arising of this comes the arising of that for example if you plant the apple seed and then years later you get a tree with apples on it then but over time sort of from that has this apple tree originated and so these two causal principles interact in a complex way So maybe just two examples, let's say you practice mindfulness of breathing and so some of the instructions of the Buddha is that you train yourself um, to practice to still the bodily sankharas, kaya sankhara or mental sankhara, chitta sankhara so that if you practice like that mindfulness of breathing then this sort of stilling of sankharas maybe only relatively will have some effect now in the present and if you if you apply your mind to the breath or to the stillness of the body then this will have some effect like now on the mind or how, the, how you feel your body um, but then also it will have some effects in this life over time so maybe your, your mind gets a different inclination or different tendencies um, and then also in future lives over t or a longer time or for example realizing the, the Four Noble Truths so stream entry but then 
seeing this vulnerable truth, which is then the opposite of Avicca, has some effects in the present, on, on the mind, immediately. For example, the one is free from disturbance or suffering that arises based on identity views and on of, about doubt. Then so this, this is an effect now, an uh, immediate effect of this cessation of the ignorance, seeing the fundamental truth. But then this effect of this of of the seeing the fundamental truth has also um, effects in the future over time. So the Buddha, for example, says that and then, for example, that this person will not be reborn in lower realms in this maximum of seven lifetimes, um, only in the future. And so this is then a mass of Dukkha which will be abandoned or comes to cessation in the future. And so the Buddha gives this simile, for example, that imagine the, imagine the entire planet Earth would be eliminated except for seven little balls of clay and then this is, this is a simile for the mass of suffering that the stream entry has eliminated in comparison to what is left. So on the one hand there is the cessation of, of suffering in, in the present, but then also this other, because of from the cessation of that, from the cessation of this comes the cessation of that, then also over time in the future. And so it would be some examples, I would say how this principle of dependent origination works in the present on a small scale in the sense of the mind or the heart itself and then over time on a more cosmic scale of the all actually like the that then at the end of the final Ibana, the five khandas um, come to cessation and all suffering and only the complete peace remains. Also may be useful for understanding dependent origination or actually realizing it it's not so sort of complicated. For example, you don't have to read ten books about it or study Buddhism for two years at university. Um, but maybe my main my main recommendation for understanding it would be mainly two things. On the one hand, developing a powerful anicca sanya, sense of perception of impermanence. Uh, perception of, of dukkha and anatta, for example, by contemplating the body, the four elements. And if you direct one's attention to that, then you will experience disenchantment, dispassion, and realize cessation, nirodha, and see. You will experience it yourself. You will see dependent origination yourself. And so it's actually not so complicated. You just have to actually apply the mind to this right thing which leads to the mind yeah, um, developing this, in this direction. Or the second thing, developing samadhi. And this, the Buddha often says that samadhi is a, a gradual stilling of sankharas. So, um, which means then, yeah, that you can actually experience the, the stilling of, of sankharas. So, that you, there's this of the stream of mental formations in the mind. You know, sankharas arising in your mind. And yeah, you don't know where they're coming from. You just this process of origination just sort of continues. And um, yeah, and then applying the teaching of the Buddha, you see how can this how can you practice so this process actually becomes less disturbing or stilled. And so yeah, by, by developing the heart you can understand it deeper and the result will be then a temporal stilling of formations of Sankara, um, which is exactly what the Buddha talks about in terms of the cessation. Um, there. So 
um, that would be the more, at least the practical application to actually realize it rather than sort of, I think often explanations are quite, or sometimes that I've read more like sort of well thought out or something like that, but in terms of realization, it's a different, um, how do I say, different thing. <laughs> And so, the, so simply that the profounder the insight into dependent origination is, the less suffering you will experience and the more profound will be the peace that you experience as a result. So that would be a, a way of gauging how far you have understood dependent origination in a sort of practical way. It's also nice to notice how the Buddha expresses that seeing causality abandons all doubt. He says all doubts vanish because he is seeing things together with their causes. And all doubts vanish because he has experienced the cessation of conditions. So, yeah, that if we don't understand something, let's say a, a simple example, Maybe a thousand years ago, people didn't know what is the cause for solar or lunar eclipse. And then it's sort of a frightening or strange phenomena that you don't understand because you don't know what's going on and what's the reason for it. But if you, if you know the cause or the causality behind it, then it's actually nothing mysterious and um, nothing frightening to it. And um, I mean, this is just on an external level, but then also in internally, then the more profoundly you have understood how the, the heart or the mind works, how suffering originates and can be abandoned. But the, the less um, the doubt will arise about that. And so, yeah, this is also nice to keep that in mind. This overcoming of doubt by seeing actually causality um, in the mind and yeah, by understanding these four noble truths more and more profoundly in terms of understanding the origin the cessation and the path if we have practice that leads to the cessation of suffering in the in the mind Then another interesting thing that the Buddha says um, in another sutta is one of the benefits of developing the perception of non-self is that we see causes and dependently arisen phenomena. So the deeper you understand anatta, non-self, the more profoundly will you will be your understanding of dependent origination. So it is like opposed seeing things as self and, and seeing causal origination of phenomena. So these are a bit opposed ways of looking at things. Um, it's also, so I noticed only of later that uh, there's this sort of connection or this um, different ways of looking at things, more or less. And so after the Buddha has contemplated dependent origination for one night, he sits down again under the Bodhi tree and again, meditates for seven days in one session, experiencing the bliss of liberation. And then after the seven days have passed and he has emerged from that samadhi, um, he is surveying the cosmos with the eyes of an awakened one. And he sees that the cosmos and all beings are blazed with the fire of desire aversion and delusion and afflicted by becoming a particle to Baba. Yeah, so the, the Buddha is talking then in this verse that he will speak, that I read afterwards um, in more detail about this one aspect of dependent origination. Pari is called Baba, usually translated as becoming, being, or existence. How becoming arises dependent on 
klinging. Ja. Die Palme wird Upadana. Can, would also be literally translated as taking up something or appropriating something. And then how it leads to suffering and how suffering ceases by the cessation of clinging. And so the Pali word Bhava is used for different in different contexts. So sometimes it's used for a certain form of existence. Like for example, existence as a human being or as an animal or as a hungry ghost or as a deva, a Brahma. And so in some suttas the Buddha says there are three kinds of becoming the karma, rupa and arupa, so the sense sense fear becoming form becoming and formless becoming um, or being and um, just like we say well just we are just basically basically this word of becoming is used for rebirth in a certain realm some often for example just like we say i've become a human being in the sense that i've been reborn as a human and not as a deva or whatever other being or animal And this word Baba is also used, how we use it in general language, just like when you say, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an actor, or uh, I want to be a millionaire, or I want to be beautiful, something like that. The one wants to be something, so <laughs> usually that they want to be something nice. So that's basically this desire of becoming, that you, you hope for some nice becoming in the future. Or then, on the other hand, maybe you don't want to be something, or you don't want to, you, not, you don't like what you are. This would be then vibhava. So it's in the sense of like I'm not wanting to be something. Um, <laughs> and so this, and this word, bhava becoming, is also used in the sense of being. So the view impression of who or what you are. So of your sense of identity or this impression I am. And the, also the Buddha calls the whole process of dependent origination a process of further becoming. So this whole process of from avicca to dukkha, this is a process of becoming. So also so he uses it like that. Itibutaka, some short sutta where the Buddha talks about about this. This is held by two kinds of views. Some devas and humans hold back and some overreach. Only those with vision see. And how do some hold back? Devas and humans enjoy becoming, delight in becoming are satisfied with becoming. When the Dhamma is taught to them for the cessation of becoming, then their minds do not enter into it or acquire confidence in it or settle upon it. And in this way, some hold back. And how do some overreach? Then it says some are troubled or ashamed or disgusted by that very becoming. And they rejoice in the idea of non-being or non-becoming in the sense of annihilation or not wanting to be something. In this way some overreach. And how do some how do those with vision see? He among sees what has come to be as having come to be. Having seen it thus, he practices he practices he practices the path for disenchantment, dispassion and for the cessation of what has come to be. And thus do those with vision see. Then he speaks a little verse. Having seen what has come to be, as having come to be, passing beyond what has come to be, they are released into accordance with truth by the cessation of the craving for, be, for becoming. When a monk has fully understood that which has come to be as such, free from craving to be this or that, by the cessation of what, what has come to be, comes to no more renewal of being. So there are these two tendencies that the mind has 
either to want to be something or then also not wanting to be something. Um, so the Buddha speaks a few four line verses. is surveying the beings or the the whole cosmos. This cosmos is burning, afflicted by contact. It calls disease a self. By whatever means it supposes anything, it becomes otherwise than that. Becoming otherwise, the cosmos is attached to becoming, afflicted by becoming, and it delights in that very becoming. Where there's delight, there's fear. What one fears is suffering. This holy life is lived for the abandoning of becoming. Whatever contemplative Brahmins see that liberation from becoming is by means of becoming, all of them are not liberated from becoming, I say. And whatever contemplative Brahmins say that the escape from becoming is by means of non-becoming, all of them have not escaped from becoming, I say. Suffering comes into play in dependence on every acquisition. With the ending of every clinging, there is no suffering coming into play. Look at this cosmos, beings afflicted by ignorance, are unreleased from passion, from, from passion for what has come to be. All levels of becoming, anywhere in any way, are impermanent, stressful, subject to change. Saying this, as it has come to be, with right wisdom, one abandons craving for becoming and doesn't delight in non-becoming. From the total ending of craving comes fading and cessation without remainder, Nibbana. For the monk unbound, through the lack of clinging, there is no further becoming. He has conquered Mara, won the battle, having gone beyond becomings, such. So, after the second week, the Buddha surveys the cosmos in this way, seeing all states of becoming, um, that are all decaying and ultimately unsatisfactory or suffering, and yeah, how he realized liberation from all becoming by the cessation of clinging. So, after these two weeks with more like very profound reflections about the origin and the cessation of suffering. Um, well the Buddha has some first interaction with some beings, some short ones. Um, after that the Buddha walks from the Bodhi tree to another tree which is close by. It's called the goat, the goat herd Spanyan tree and then he meditates there for another week experiencing the bliss of liberation. And so then he has his first encounter with another being. Uh, a Brahmin meets the Buddha and um, the Buddha gives him a short teaching, just one verse. <coughs> so after the Buddha has emerged from the Samadhi, then a certain haughty Brahmin approaches the Blessed One. Having approached him, he exchanged polite greetings with him and stood to one side. And then standing there, the Brahmin says to the, to the Buddha, How is one a Brahmin? And what are the things that make one a Brahmin? And so the Buddha just speaks a very short verses teaching. A Brahmin is one who has discarded evil states, not haughty, free from stains, self-controlled. Perfect in knowledge, one who has lived a holy life. He might rightly be called a Brahmin, who has no swellings of pride anywhere in the world. Now, after this week, the Buddha further goes to the Muchalinda tree. And 
meditating there for another seven days. And at that time, out of season, a great rainstorm arose. And for seven days, there were rain clouds, cold winds, and unsettled weather. And then Muchalinda, the Naga king, left his dwelling place and having encircled the, the Blessed One's body seven times with his coils, he stood with his great hood spread over the Blessed One's head, thinking to protecting the Blessed One from cold and heat. And then at the end of the seven days, the Buddha um, emerges from his Samadhi. And then Muchalinda, the Naga king, sees that the sky is clear again um, at the rain clouds. Um, are gone. He removes his coils from the body of the Buddha and changes his appearance and assumes the appearance of a young man and stands in front of him um, with folded hands together in veneration. And then the Buddha gives him a short teaching. Blissful is seclusion for one who is content, for one who has learned the Dhamma and who sees. Blissful is non-harming in the world, restraints towards living beings. Blissful is, passion and blissful is passionless, passionlessness in the world, the overcoming of sensual desires, but the abandoning of the conceit I am that is truly the supreme bliss. So then after these seven days, the Buddha goes to from the Muchalinda tree to another tree, the Rajayatana tree, and um, meditates there for another seven days. And then at that time, two merchants, Tapusa and Balika, are traveling on the road from a place called Ukala. Um, and so they're traveling there, not far from where the Buddha attained awakening. and. Then uh, a deva appears to them, who was a former relative of them. And um, so the deva tells them about the Buddha. And um, the deva says, There is the Blessed One, Matthias, dwelling at the root of the Rajayatana tree, who has just realized awakening. Go and serve the Blessed One with cooked grain meals and, and honey balls. That will be for a long lasting welfare and happiness. And so the Two merchants, Tapusa and Balika, take the, the food and go to the Buddha and uh, bow to him and offer him the food. And also, and the, the Buddha then, interestingly, he doesn't have any arms bowl at that time. He, they want to offer him something and he says, Tathagatas, he, 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 he thinks Tathagatas don't accept things with the hands, like they don't just take the food. It's just in the hands like this. Um, what should I use to accept this this meal now? And then the the devas, the four great kings, the rulers of the lowest heavenly realms, they offer him some stone balls, and then he apparently uses these balls probably until the end of his life. So um, yeah, and so then the Buddha eats his first meal after his awakening, and Taposa and Balika become the first two male lay disciples of the Buddha. Um, they, they go for refuge to the Buddha and the Dhamma and become lay followers. So Sujata, before the awakening, becomes the first female lay disciple of the Buddha. And now uh, all these two merchants are the first male lay disciples. Yeah, then afterwards the Buddha is going, going back to the goat herd's banyan tree um, and at the time um, Mara is visiting him um, trying to challenge the Buddha that he abandoned asceticism and sort of didn't follow the path to purity because he abandoned his ascetic practices. Um, then in the suttas there are only some discourses on the one hand before the awakening of the Buddha where Mara is visiting him, and then also um, some afterwards. 
So yeah, Mara has these three meanings in, in the suttas, on the one hand of defilements that prevent someone from awakening. On the other hand, it's used for Mara is also used for what is subject to death. For example, the Buddha says um, form is Mara or feeling is Mara or belongs to Mara in the sense that it's that it's subject to decay or impermanent. And um, but then also sometimes in suttas you can notice there's a Mara is an entity that tries to prevent people from awakening, or sometimes also harasses people that have already realized awakening. And so yeah. But the Buddha answers with a short verse and um Mara has to leave sad and dejected and vanishes defeated. And so at least my interpretation is that I think one of Mara's weaknesses is that he's very self-confident. So we just can't imagine that someone actually has escaped from his power. And of and then he tries several times because he just can't believe it. Um, then usually he's the, the Buddha says even that Mara is the most influential being in the universe, in the sense of having in sense of control or, or power. Um, and so, yeah, usually it would be very rare that someone escapes him. So he still trying even after the awakening, but yeah, he has to vanish sad and dejected. <laughs> And the Buddha then continues to stay at the good herd spanyan tree and he reflects about the path of practice that led to his awakening, the four foundations of mindfulness and the five faculties. reflects then this is the one way path for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the passing away of pain and displeasure, and for the achievement of the method, for the realization of Nibbana, that is the four foundations of mindfulness. What for? He among the wells contemplating the body as a body, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed covetousness and displeasure in regard to the world, and wells contemplating feelings as feelings, mind as mind, and phenomena as phenomena, are then clearly comprehending and mindful, having removed covetousness and displeasure in regard to the world. And then, so then, after Mara is vanished, um, then another being, in this case Adeva, comes, um, Brahma Sahampati, and he, um, having known the reflection of the Buddha, appears in his presence and um, raises his hands in veneration and says, so is it, blessed one, so is it, fortunate one. This is the one way pass to purification of beings, the four foundations of mindfulness. And then similar with the five faculties, and he reflects these five faculties when they cultivated and developed have the deathless as the grounds, the deathless as the destination, and the deathless as the final goal. What five? The faculty of faith, the faculty of energy, the faculty of mindfulness, and the faculty of samadhi, the faculty of wisdom. And then again, Brahma Sahampati, having known the mind of the Buddha, appears in front of him and says, so is it, blessed one, these five faculties um, have the deathless as their goal. And he also says, once in the past, I lived the holy life under the, per under the perfectly awakened one, Kasapa. There they knew me as a bhikkhu, Sahaka. So um, Brahma Sahampati was in a previous life uh, a monk. Um, at the time of the Buddha, before our historic Buddha. So the Buddha sometimes mentions six Buddhas before him. It appeared in this present eon or previous eons. And then so the 
the Buddha before Buddha Gautama was Buddha Kasapa, and so he practices monk there, and he says he has developed and cultivated these five faculties, and because he abandoned the five lower fetters, he was um, reborn. Yeah, he became a non-returner and was reborn into the Vasa realm, and so there they know me as Brahma Sahampati. So yeah, one, this is the only place where one gets this background information who is Brahma Sahampati, actually, um, and so he's a, a, a non-returner from a previous Buddha who notices that something special happens and then goes to visit him. Then also an uh, unusual reflection arises in the mind of the Buddha. Even the Buddha wants to dwell respecting something. Um, so the Buddha reflects, one dwells in suffering if one is without reverence, reverence and deference. Is there any ascetic or Brahmin that I can honor or respect and dwell in dependence on? But he sees there is no other Samana Brahmin, no religious teacher or practitioner who is superior virtue, superior Samadhi, superior wisdom or superior liberation than he has. And then seeing that, he thinks, let me then honor, respect and dwell in dependence on this very Dhamma to which I have fully awakened. So the Buddha is even also honoring something on the, the Dhamma, the law of nature, and the teaching that he discovered. And then also on that occasion, Brahma Sahampati appears in front of him and says, so is it, blessed one, so is it, fortunate one. Those who were Arahants, perfectly awakened ones in the past, those blessed ones too, honored, respected and dwelt in dependence on justice Dhamma itself. And those who will be the Arahants, the perfectly enlightened ones in the future, those blessed one too will honor, respect, and dwell independence um, of the Dhamma itself. Let the blessed one too, who is presently the perfectly awakened one, honor and respect and dwell independence on justice Dhamma itself. Then Brahma Sambhati speaks a short verse. It's also in a chanting book. All the Buddhas of the past, all the Buddhas yet to come, the Buddha of this current age, dispellers of much sorrow, those having lived or living now, those living in the future, all do revere the true Dhamma, this is the nature of all Buddhas. Therefore, desiring one's own welfare, pursuing greatest aspirations, one should revere the true Dhamma, recollecting the Buddha's teaching. So this is from this occasion um, <laughs> when, yeah, after the awakening of the Buddha, when he decides to dwell respecting the Dhamma itself. Then we're still dwelling at the foot of the goat herd spanyan tree. The Buddha is alone. This kind of reflection arises in him. This Dhamma that I've attained is deep, hard to see, hard to realize, peaceful, refined, beyond the scope of conjecture, subtle, to be experienced by the wise. But this generation delights in attachment, it's excited by attachment enjoys attachment. For generation delighting in attachment, excited in by attachment, enjoying attachment, this that conditionality and dependent origination are hard to see. And that too is hard to see, the stilling of all fabrications, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the ending of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. And if I were to teach the Dhamma, and if others would not understand me, 
that would be tiresome for me and troublesome for me. And so then, on that occasion, this short verse comes to the mind of the Buddha. Enough now with teaching, but only with difficulty I reached. This Dhamma is not easily realized by those overcome with passion and aversion. What is subtle, deep, difficult to see, going against the stream, those delighting in passion, shrouded in darkness, won't see. Yeah, the mind of the completely liberated Buddha didn't have any compulsion to teach. The, and it could incline either way. So it is true that the Dhamma is difficult to understand for beings, but it is also true that some people have the possibility to, to realize it and are able to realize it. Um, and then Again, Brahma Sampati um, notices the thought of the Buddha and thinks, This world is lost, this world is destroyed. The mind of the Tathagata, the Arahant, the perfectly awakened one, inclines to dwelling at ease and not to teaching the Dhamma. And then he appears in front of him and raises his hand in Anjali and says, Let the blessed one teach the Dhamma, let the fortunate one teach the Dhamma. They are beings with little dust in their eyes, who are falling away because they do not hear the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. <coughs> and then he speaks a verse to um, let's say, encourage the Buddha to teach the Dhamma. In Magadha there have appeared until now impure teachings devised by those still stained. Throw open the doors to the deathless. Let them hear the Dhamma that the stainless one discovered. Just like one who stands on the peak of a mountain can see the people all around below, so too, O wise one, universal seer, ascend to the palace made of the Dhamma. Free from sorrow, behold the people submerged in sorrow, oppressed by birth and aging. Arise, O hero, victor in battle. As teacher, wander in the world without debt. Teach the Dhamma, O blessed one. There will be those who will understand. Yeah, the Devas often speak in verses, so they, because they're also of lofty, elevated beings, it's not appropriate that they speak in verses, and it's also nice, it's just very short to actually listen to the party also sounds nice to hear it once one doesn't hear it often paturaho si magadi supumbe dhammo asundo samali chintito apa puritang amatasadvarang Sonanto dhammang vimalina nubundhang Sele yata pam vatamunda nitito Yata pipasse chanatang samantato Tatu pamang dhamma mayang sumida Pasadam ahuya samanta chako Soka vatinang chanatam apita soko Aveka soja di charabi putang Uti vira vichata sangama, Satavaha anana vichara loke, De sasso bhagavad hamang, Anya taro bhavisanti. So after the then the Blessed One, having understood Brahma's invitation, out of compassion for beings, surveyed the cosmos with the eye of an awakened one. As he did so, he saw beings with little dust in their eyes, and those with much dust in their eyes. 
those with keen faculties and those with dull faculties, those with good attributes and those with bad attributes, those easy to teach and those hard to teach, and some of them seeing disgrace and danger in the other world. Just as in a pond of blue or red or white lotuses, some lotuses born and growing in the water might grow immersed in the water without rising up from the water. Some might stand at an even level with the water, where some might rise up from the water and stand without being sullied by the water. So too, surveying the cosmos with the eye of an awakened one, the blessed one saw beings with little dust in the eyes and those with much dust in the eyes, those with keen faculties and those with dull faculties, those with good attributes and those with bad attributes, those easy to teach and those hard to teach. And then he responds to Brahma Sampati's invitation with also with a verse. The doors to the deathless are open for them. May those who are willing to listen unleash their faith. Thinking it would be troublesome, O Brahma, I didn't speak the subtle and sublime Dhamma. Aparutati sang amatasatvara, li so tavanto pamonchanto sandang, vihing sa sandi pagunang na pasing, damang panitang manoche so pahme. And Brahma Sampati is then knows that the Blessed One has now accepted his invitation to teach, is paying respects and thinks. I created, the opportunity, I created the opportunity that the Blessed One will teach the Dhamma. So obviously it's a major event in the cosmos that um, if you invite a Buddha to teach or you are the cause for a Buddha to teach, then it's obviously an um, occasion for Mudita, <laughs> for oneself as well and for others. So he is very happy that um, he created this opportunity that the Buddha teaches the Dhamma. <laughs> Yeah, so these were the weeks after the awakening of the Buddha. Um, yeah, then afterwards, he will start to reflect who would be the first people that he should teach, um, who would be most receptive to the teaching. <coughs> 